welcome back to another week of our study through Acts. My name is Simon Campbell, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Director at Prairie Lakes. As a part of our Central Services team, I get to work with our campuses and set them up for success with systems and best practices for our communication tools. I also get to work with our teams to implement digital strategies to reach new people and invite them to come see who Jesus is and what the church is all about. And one of my favorite things about my job is when I get to help tell stories of how God brought people to Prairie Lakes and their first experiences of a Nomadder church. And one of the common themes I hear in these stories is how welcoming the people of Prairie Lakes were to them and how it almost immediately felt like home. We all love being warmly welcomed, especially when we're trying something new or meeting people for the first time. My wife, Laura, and I are high school sweethearts, and I remember the first time I met her very large extended family. They had a family reunion over Thanksgiving every year, and even as the new boyfriend, I was invited along. And I remember feeling pretty nervous as I was walking up to the town hall that they had rented out. Again, big family, pretty sure there were like five turkeys. Um, but yeah, I remember that when I walked in, a couple of Laura's aunts came in and said to me, oh, hi, honey, gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek and then handed me a baby cousin saying, can you hold him a minute? And um, <laughs> for me as an outsider to be welcomed so warmly and treated like family from the moment I walked in, was so unexpected and yet so wonderful. And as Laura and I have been married for over 13 years now, I can see how those early connections were the start of some deep bonds that continue to impact me as a part of their family. So in your groups, I want you to take a few minutes to tell the story of a time when you were warmly welcomed, and that could be at Prairie Lakes or anywhere else. Talk about what that meant to you, and then if that experience continues to impact you now in any way. So get ready to pause the video, spend some time sharing together, and press play when you're ready to continue. I hope you had fun sharing some good stories together. Let's go ahead and jump into this week's section of Acts where we'll be spending time in chapters 13 through 15, especially chapter 15 in the story of the Jerusalem Council. And I hope you can sense my excitement for you as we look at this story because this is a huge turning point for the rest of the book of Acts. And I love this part of the early church's story because I think this is one of the places that we can point to as the launching of God's no matter mission in the early church. But before we get into all that, we have a little bit of backstory to get into, so I'll leave you in suspense for now. Remember, the book of Acts follows the actions of the apostles, the original followers of Jesus, as they are used by God to start a worldwide movement of Christianity that continues to this day. Acts is the story of how the church started. And as you read the book of Acts, you start to see some of the events that have major ripple effects on the direction of the church afterward. We've already talked about a couple of these, in week three, we heard about the stoning of Stephen and the, the first Christian who died for his faith. And in week four, we focused on the story of Peter's vision. Both of these events set things in motion that led to the Jerusalem Council in chapter 15. So when Stephen was killed and violence broke out against Christians, one of these ripple effects was that Christians were scattered out from Jerusalem all over the place, taking the message of Jesus with them. And as a result, they formed new pockets of Jesus followers. There's a quick passage that you might have seen last week in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, that talks about this. Now, those who had been scattered by th this persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word among only Jews. And boom, just like that, the Christian church became multi-site. But there's this little interesting detail at the end of that verse. It said that the message of Jesus was only spread among other Jews. And at this point, there was still a pretty clear division in the church between insiders, the Jews, and outsiders, the Gentiles. The Jews were descendants of the nation of Israel, a people group chosen and set apart by God in the time of the Old Testament. The label of Gentile was really like a catch-all term for anyone who had a different background other than Jewish. And we've mentioned this in previous weeks, but Luke, the writer of Acts, 
was a Gentile himself. So I think it's really unique that we get his perspective on this insider-outsider dynamic in the early church. It changes the way we read these little details like that phrase in verse 19. So anyway, one of the groups of believers leaving Jerusalem after Stephen's murder was made up of people who primarily spoke Greek. And they started a church in a city 300 miles away called Antioch. That's about the distance between Dubuque and Sioux City in Iowa terms. And because they spoke Greek, which was the most common and widely used language in that part of the world, they started sharing the message of Jesus with Gentiles, outsiders, in addition to Jews, the insiders. And as a result, many Gentiles turned to God and became believers in Jesus. The news of this exciting development reached the ears of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem, back where all this got started. So they sent a guy named Barnabas to go check it out. Barnabas was so encouraged by what he saw God doing in Antioch that he went to go get Paul, who you'll remember from last week was the guy formerly known as Saul who had been hunting Christians, but was now a missionary disciple of Jesus. Anyway, Barnabas goes back to get Paul in Paul's hometown of Tarsus, 90 miles away, um, in Iowa terms about Cedar Falls to Fort Dodge. And the Antioch church became something of a home church for Barnabas and Paul. And Acts chapter 13 opens with them teaming up to go out to share the message of Jesus to both Jews and Gentiles living in cities all around the region of Antioch. And as you read about what happened to Paul and Barnabas as they shared the message of Jesus, a pattern starts to emerge. At most of the communities they go to, their message is initially welcomed by Jews and Gentiles and many believe. But after a while, some Jews, the insiders, feel threatened by this new message of salvation that includes Gentiles, the outsiders, and start resisting Paul and Barnabas. Then we see that resistance escalate and Paul and Barnabas are either kicked out, harassed, or almost killed. Despite this opposition, many people come to believe and new churches are formed and Paul and Barnabas keep moving around the region. There's this great section of chapter 13 that gives us a glimpse of the message that Paul and Barnabas shared in these communities, as well as the uh, not so nice reaction they received from some Jewish insiders. So in your groups, go around and read through Acts chapter 13 verses 38 through 49 together. Then you can spend some time answering the questions that will be on your screen. So get ready to pause the video and press play when you're ready to keep going. Thanks for talking through those questions with your group. After Paul and Barnabas had made their way around the region delivering the message that you just read, they returned to their home church in Antioch to give a report of everything that God had done through them. Luke writes that they stayed there a while until some rogue Christian teachers came to Antioch from the area around Jerusalem. These teachers started preaching that Gentiles had to be circumcised first in order to be saved and considered part of the people of God. Talk about a barrier to belonging. I mean, needless to say, Paul and Barnabas were not happy to hear this conflicting message. And as Luke diplomatically writes, they disputed sharply with those teachers. I kind of like to imagine that Paul and Barnabas were kind of ready to throw down here. They clearly did not like anyone creating a barrier for Gentiles turning to Jesus. And they didn't believe that the Gentile outsiders needed to be exactly like the Jewish insiders, observing all of the customs and ritual laws in order to be part of the Christian church. So Paul and Barnabas decided to take this issue to the apostles and leaders of the church in Jerusalem for a meeting that has become known as the Jerusalem Council. And as I mentioned before, this council is a huge turning point for the rest of the book of Acts and for the direction of the church as a whole. It was a big deal. So you see, nearly all of the believers in Jerusalem would have been of a Jewish background at this point. But you might be wondering, well, what about Pentecost when the disciples spoke the message of Jesus in a bunch of different languages to people from all over the world? Well. Luke includes a very important detail in Acts 2 verse 5 when he writes that the crowd was made up of Jews from every nation under heaven. They may have been from different parts of the world and spoke different languages, but they shared the same Jewish culture, heritage, and religious system. They had grown up observing the entire Mosaic law, 
a collection of 613 rules from the Old Testament and all the ritual customs that went along with them. This has been a large part of their way of life, something they practiced every day. And even though Jesus had defied their expectations of a savior and even criticized at times the religious culture at the, of the Jewish people, these early Christians were still just trying to figure out what it meant to keep and what they needed to leave behind as an early church. The council made up of Jewish Christians would need to decide how to approach these Gentile outsiders and what would be expected of them as new believers in Jesus. So at this council, some of the Jewish insiders stood up and said that they believed that the Jew Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. And after some discussion, Peter gets up to share his perspective. Now you remember Peter's dream when that we looked at last week with the sheet coming down from heaven, all of the clean and unclean animals together and how God said that there was what was once unclean and off limits was now made pure by God. Well, here is where we see the ripple effect of that vision. Let's read what Peter says in Acts 15 verses 7 through 11. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Peter makes his position super clear that he doesn't think that the Gentiles should be required to be circumcised or keep the entirety of the Mosaic law. The division of insiders and outsiders are gone because God has made salvation available to all in Jesus and has given the Holy Spirit to all kinds of people. God does not discriminate. Peter also makes another important point saying, how can we place expectations on outsiders that we've never been able to keep, live up to ourselves? Peter recognizes and states that no matter who you are or what your background is, when you believe in Jesus, you're saved by grace, a free gift given to us in Jesus, same as anyone, whether you're Jewish or Gentile. There's no insider or outsider anymore. And after the council discussed things further, Paul and Barnabas shared stories about what God had done among the Gentiles from their journeys. This further supported and gave evidence to what Peter said. Then James, who is the half-brother of Jesus and the leader of the church in Jerusalem, gave a ruling for the council. You can see this in Acts 15, 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult, difficult for Gentiles who are returning to God. This decision marked a radical shift in the church and is a turning point for the rest of Acts. This decision to remove barriers, make it easy for people outside the church to turn to God, still has impact on the church today. All right, we're gonna make some space for you and your last round of discussion questions. Get ready to pause the video, spend time sharing together, and press play when you're ready to continue. The Jerusalem Council shows us that from the beginning, the Church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be a place where no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or what's been done to you, you'll hear that God loves you and offers salvation to you in Jesus. There should be no insiders or outsiders because Jesus does not discriminate and calls every kind of person to follow him and become a part of God's family. We have all been saved by grace. None of us are perfect. No one else has special status. Jesus is for everyone. So we can and should be part of removing barriers for others so it's easier for them to find their way to God. The rest of the book of Acts shows us how this decision about the early church's approach toward the Gentiles launches a mission to reach the known world with the message of Jesus. It changed everything. Paul and his companions start churches in places like Corinth, Ephesus, and Thessalonica, just to name a few. And they would later write letters to these churches that became a large portion of the New Testament in our Bibles today. So as you leave your group today, continue to reflect on what it looks like for you to reach people outside the church. It might look a little different for you today 
in Iowa than it did in the time of Acts. But you honor this decision made by the Jerusalem Council and you partner in the no matter mission it launched when you break down barriers for people to look for God and help them turn to Jesus. You can be part of making the church a place where there's no division between insider and outsider. You can help make it easy for people to find a place to belong and believe. And the next time you attend a Sunday service, I hope you'll be looking for ways you can offer someone a warm welcome or an invitation to come sit with you because you never know when you might be part of a story God is writing to change someone's life forever. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for the decision that you led the Jerusalem Council to make, that you wanted to, to make the church a place where there's no division between insider and outsider. And God, we pray that as we reflect on this, that we would look for opportunities to remove barriers for people, to make it easy for them to look for you and to find you. God, I ask that as we've been going through these discussions and you've been stirring up these ideas um, in our hearts, God, that you would just take those to fruition and bring about action in our lives so that we might be a part of what you're doing, both in our worlds, our neighborhoods, but also across Iowa. And we ask this all in your name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this week of the Acts study. And we'll see you back next week for our final week of the Acts series. And as we talk about Paul's missionary journeys.